Okay guys, hello. Um, my name's Nissa, and probably lots of you don't know me. Um, I'm very, very, very excited to be here. Um, I am a working midwife in a very busy central London hospital. I am a, let me just twiddle my camera a little bit, um, I am a hypnobirthing teacher, so I teach um, group and private classes in London, I'm a mum of one and um, also founder of AlignYourBaby.com. So I teach mums and birth professionals how to get their babies into better position for an easier birth. So what are we doing today? So I'm going to be with you for the next hour, so until probably about 10 past 11. And I'm going to be answering all of your questions about how can you enjoy an easier birth. Um, so I'm super excited. So if you're watching this live, then please feel free to pop your questions. I think it's down there. Um, and I will do my best to answer them all in the time that we have. I've also got a fabulous list of questions that Maury have given me already that have been collected up from um, Instagram and Facebook and private messages as well. So I'm going to start with those. So I'm just going to crack them open and see what we've got to start with. So, do, 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 do. hope you're all feeling really good today. Okay, um, and um, this one is more for pregnant mums. So if you've got friends that are expecting and you think, oh, they could, they could do with some positivity and some practical tips, you can tag them in below. Next week I'm doing um, a Q&A about after baby arrives. So if you've got questions about um, anything to do with after baby being born, please, please, please um, come and join me next week. And I'm sure that will be all over the page so you can, um, you can find out when that is. Um, I can't remember. Um, so question number one. Um, so it's, uh, it's from Becca7146. So this is one from Instagram. And she says, hey Becca, she says, um, can you ask um, to be induced at 40 plus weeks instead of waiting until 41 weeks? So that's an interesting question. So we're thinking about um, reasons for induction. So... So the most common reason for induction of labour um, is going over your due date. So that means being um, over 41 weeks of pregnancy towards really towards 42 weeks of pregnancy. So the reason that induction is offered at that stage is that there's some evidence and there's some research that suggests that for some mums, after 42 weeks of pregnancy, your um, placenta may not work as well and baby may not be getting um, what they need in terms of blood flow, oxygen, nutrients um, to keep them really well. So the risk of stillbirth does increase a little bit after 42 weeks. So that's why induction of labour is offered. It is your choice, so you can decline that if you've got all the information. So um, Sarah's saying, can I have induction earlier? I don't want to wait to 41 weeks. So I would ask, I, I'm, you're not here, mate. Well, you might be watching Sarah, I'm not sure sure but um, I don't know the reason why you want to bring that induction forward so is there something that you're worried about have you got a concern um, is your baby not moving as much as normal if any of those things are the case please do talk to your care provider your midwife or your doctor and tell them that so that you can um, talk that through and just make sure is there any medical reason for bringing the induction you know, forward a little bit. Um, and if there was, then maybe, yeah, that might be something that was applicable. The NICE guidelines, so the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, 
suggests that, and that's for the UK, so I'm not talking for um, America and Australia, um, but for the UK, they recommend that induction is offered from 41 weeks and 3 days up until 41 plus 6, and the idea is that um, induction can take a little while for a first baby, but if you start in that time frame, then you'll probably be in labour and have birthed your baby before you get to 42 weeks. Um, what, bringing induction forward. So I would say um, bringing induction forward, having it sooner, if there isn't a real medical reason, we're not concerned that you're, there's a problem with your baby or with you at all, um, probably might not be the best idea actually because... The thing with induction is, if your body's really ready to go, it's like it's teetering on the edge, um, it's thinking about going into labour, maybe your cervix has started to change inside a little bit, um, then actually um, induction might be quite simple, might be quite straightforward, um, might not take too long, um, and you're working with your body, and that will make your birth a lot easier more natural, more comfortable, more manageable, less likely that it will be long and you'd need an epidural um, to help you. Whereas if you go for induction at a point when your body, it really isn't ready, like it's not, it's not changing inside, the hormones aren't really flowing, um, and that means induction earlier, earlier on in the pregnancy, probably that process is going to be more difficult because you're you're kind of working against your body you know your body's not really up for it and um, so you're trying to get your body to do something that it's not particularly ready for um, so it means that the process might take a lot longer so instead of 12 hours or 24 hours you might be looking at 48 72 hours with the process instead of just having the um, the more simple process so just the pessary or the gel to get things going you might need to go further have your waters broken also perhaps have the syntocin on drip in your hand or your arm um, and that's gonna that's gonna make it you're gonna be a bit more tired um, probably it's it's gonna you know, it's not going to be quite so easy. So I would say, unless there was a medical reason for having that induction earlier, um, perhaps, um, Sarah, something that you could do instead is start thinking about all the natural things that you can do yourself to to prime your body to to get it, you know, get it going. If you're just a, if you're quite fed up, I completely understand. I remember being forty weeks pregnant and thinking. I'm kind of over this, you know, I'm, 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 I'm ready to go, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to give birth now. Um, you can think about the things that you can do that, that are less interventional, more natural to do, and just, you know, I can shoot you a list on, on my hand. So I would go for some acupuncture, works wonders, reflexology is brilliant, um, you can go for a really long walk two hours good hiking walk um, have a really relaxing bath with maybe some clary sage oil you spell that c-l-a-r-y and sage like sage you can buy that from a health food store it's a strong oil it can get you into labor it can it can just trigger you into labor you can use that in the bath so you put maybe 20 drops of clary sage oil um, into some milk, a little thing of milk, like normal milk that you have in your tea. Pop that in the bath, have a really long, not too hot, 36.5, 37 degrees max bath, not too hot. Have a good one to two hour soak in there, music on, candles, you know, all that good relaxing stuff. Um, and that can help your body relax and go, oh, you know, help you get into labour. Go for a lovely massage, or if you have a partner, get your partner to give you a really good massage again with the clary sage oil. Don't use the clary sage oil um, neat because it's too strong. So you want to mix it. So a tablespoon of a neutral base oil like almond, sunflower from the kitchen, 
um, what else, olive oil, coconut oil, something like that, with five drops of clary sage into that tablespoon, and um, a lovely massage with that. That's the kind of stuff that can definitely can push you into, into natural labour, um, and even if you are going for induction, I would really recommend that you do all of that stuff as well, um, because that's going to really support your body, your body's, you know, natural hormones, and get you into that lovely relaxing mindset as well. So that was question number one. I'm going to check for question number one. I have to say, guys, I'm very excited. I've been looking forward to this. Um, all all last week and this week as well. Um, second question. This is from at Captain Whitebread. So it's another one from Instagram. And uh, Captain Whitebread, you say, I tore badly with my first baby and needed reconstructive surgery immediately after labour. I'm so sorry, my darling. That's a tough one. Um, this time I'm considering an episiotomy but feel very uneasy about it. Any thoughts or experiences on this? I could use some input. Okay, so that yeah, I can imagine if you had a tear, big tear last time, um, you're, you're probably feeling quite tentative um, and a bit nervous as well, completely understandably. Um, what I will say for everyone else that's watching, it's quite unusual to have a third degree tear or a fourth degree tear. We don't see them very often. Um, it's quite common to have a small tear, a graze or, um, you know, more of a, uh, like when you fall over and scrape your knee, something like that. That's quite common and for most mums, the majority, that will heal beautifully. Um, the skin uh, around that area, your perineum, is very much like the skin inside your mouth. It's very, uh, it's got really good blood flow. It heals very quickly. You know, when you go to the dentist and you have something done within 48 hours, you know, you feel okay. It's quite, it heals because of that, um, that good blood flow. But for um, Captain Whitebread, so let's think. So you're thinking about this birth. So probably I would say there's some work that you could do in pregnancy now and I would recommend this for any pregnant mum that's watching. So all of you lovelies that are watching, I think it's a good idea to do this um, regardless of if it's your first, second, third baby. It's probably worth doing. So some of you will know about perennial massage and um, perennial massage is a kind of massage, it's not quite the massage that we're used to and the aim of perennial massage is that you will be um, stretching the skin around your vagina which is the skin that normally stretches when your baby's born and the I'll, I'll explain how to do it in a minute, I'll go through it quickly so this is something that's recommended that you do from 34 weeks of pregnancy and you do it three times a week, more or less, you know, for three, four, five minutes. So it's not a long time. Um, it's a small investment, ladies, for potentially, um, you know, a really good return. So. The, um, there's good research out there that suggests that this may uh, reduce the risk of having a tear and certainly of having a, a more serious tear. So, how do we do the perennial massage? So, um, actually, I'm going to get you to do it with me in a way. Not down there, but we're going to do it on our hands. So, for all of you that are watching now, and I can see there's quite a lot of people watching, so ladies, do this with me if you can. Obviously, if you're watching sneakily at work, then um, you can do this later. But if you can, join me. So, first of all, this is I'm taking my hand as my perineum. So, this is 
today this is going to be my vagina so we're thinking that baby when he baby's born baby's head will be coming through here and my bottom would be down here so this is my perineum it's the skin between my vagina and my bottom right here okay and this is the skin mostly that gets a bit damaged and it's the skin that has to stretch the most when baby's born so Imagine baby being born, that's going to stretch beautifully. So, this is the, how I'm going to demonstrate it. So, if you'll all take your hands like this, everybody, put them together. Do it with me. Join me. First practice of perennial massage, if you haven't done it before. Just, just going to do it for one minute, just to demonstrate. So, put your hands together. Now, flick your thumbs back, like so. And do your thumb stretch back you know, symmetrically. Most people, their thumbs will have about the same amount of stretch in them, okay? And we're going to do a little test to show you how this can work. So, we're going to do the massage on one of our hands, as if this is our perineum. So normally, if that's your vagina, your thumb will go inside the vagina, probably up to the first knuckle, so it'll go in a bit, and it's going to, you're going to stretch down, push quite firmly down, and stretch the outside with your finger. So it's as if we're kneading the perineum. It's very, very glamorous, ladies, having a baby. It's what everybody dreams of doing. Join me now. So if you're watching, everybody, please, I'd like you to, to massage your fake perineum. We're going to do this for a minute. Be firm. You want to really get in there, get the blood flowing. Feel that you, you know, you're pushing, you're feeling it a little bit, you know, so keep going like that. Um, if you're trying this for the first time at home, for real, it can feel weird, it's uncomfortable, um, you know, the first two, three times you might not really be up for it, stick with it if you can, because it really is valuable and reduces the risk of having a tear. It also will um, mean that in labour, you would have experienced, keep going, some of the sensations of that stretching and probably if you haven't had a baby before you won't have felt that stretch in that way um, and so that's quite helpful because if you've, had, you've felt it stretched before it's less um, overwhelming, you know, it's not scary. So hopefully you've all been massaging um, does it matter how far you go in? You want to go in when you're doing it for real, you know, probably up to your knuckle. So you need to go in a little bit so that you can push down, I would say. And actually when you're doing it for real, you've got to do this area, but actually you want to do the sides as well, where your labia is. And if you can, even a little bit at the top, because occasionally mums will have a little bit of a tear on their clitoris as well, which can be really stingy. Um, so I would do it all the way around. I'd say. So, now everybody, you've, hopefully you've done a good minute of massage with me. Pop your hands together, stretch your thumbs back, and just see, is there a difference? So does one thumb stretch more than the other? So I've been, <laughs> I've been teaching prenal massage. I teach it to all of my clients. I've been teaching for about well, three years and I've been teaching antenatal for four, five years. So my thumb is well stretched because I always practice on the same hand. Now don't be concerned if um, you don't have much difference in your thumb. You haven't done this, you know, a hundred or two hundred times like me. So when you do it more and more and more, you will definitely start to see the stretch. Well you, well, you wouldn't. If you were doing it on your thumb, if you're doing it down below, you will get more stretch each time. So it's that repetition that's really valuable. Um, and I'd recommend you do it with a bit of natural oil, nothing with any fragrance. Maybe um, it could be a bit of um, you know, sunflower almond oil or um, KY jelly, some lubricant or something, just to, to make it a bit easier down there. Um, so I'd say definitely do that, um, Captain Whitebeard, and, White Bread, I should say. And what else? Whether to opt for an episiotomy. I don't think that I can say yes or no. I think it's really dependent on what's happening on the, the day. 
So you're going to work really closely with your um, midwife or your doctor on the day. You'll be listening to them, particularly as the baby's head starts to come down and crown, so that you can stop pushing and just breathe. <sighs> or they might get you to pant. So that actually the baby's head, it doesn't come quickly, that increases the risk of the tear, but actually it's going to come really slowly like this. And actually it's only the practitioners on the day, my darling, who would really be able to tell you in that time, does it look like there's enough stretch? Um, quite often with a first baby you get a, a tear or a small tear and with a second you don't get any that's quite common and so because you had a serious tear before it doesn't mean that you will have one again but it's going to be depending on what your care providers see so trust them work closely with them really listen to what they say um, and that will that will really help you um, and do the massage as well um, and Tracy West, I hear wheat germ oil is good. Yeah, absolutely. Anything that's not fragranced um, is apricot oil is lovely. All of those ones, I'd say. Something really natural. Go for a good quality one because um, it can be a bit stingy otherwise. So I'm going to go to question number three. Um, this it, this is a, we don't know who this one's from so this one's an anonymous question my main concern is staying in the zone when I arrive at the hospital I'm worried the strip lighting noises strange people are going to unsettle me and make the adrenaline get going so I think that's a really really great question and that's one that's right up my street as a hypnobirthing teacher so just a one minute recap ladies so you want to be working with your birth hormones your oxytocin and your endorphins those are the hormones that will make your labor quicker they'll make it more manageable more comfortable um, and you'll be able to cope better if they're flowing beautifully if you start kicking out lots of adrenaline when you're in labor that means being stressed fearful anxious, afraid, uncomfortable, that the adrenaline will directly impact on your birth hormones and they will reduce. So your oxytocin will reduce, which means that your surges or your contractions um, may get further apart, they might get shorter, um, or they may become irregular, which means potentially your labour is going to slow down. If you're kicking out loads of adrenaline, you also may, it will, you will reduce the endorphins, endogenous morphines, morphine that your body makes itself during labour, and endorphins take the pain away. So they're your body's compensation. That your body, your muscles are working hard, but you're kicking out endorphins, which is what makes it okay, makes it manageable. The adrenaline reduces the endorphins, so potentially, yeah, you're gonna feel um, the surges or the contractions more intensely. You're gonna get more pain. So really important question. So I would definitely say to this lady, we don't know your name. Um, is home birth an option for you? Have you thought about home birth? Um, if you have a straightforward pregnancy and there's nothing going on for you, um, I think home birth is a fantastic option. Um, it's incredibly relaxed um, because you're in your own home environment. It's the most relaxing environment that there can be for you your own bed, your own bath, you can have a birth pool there if you want to. Midwives are coming to you so that they can, you know, they're in your um, environment. So you're not saying, oh, can I have this? Can I do this? Where's this? As you might do in the hospital. Actually, they're saying to you, can we have a cup of tea? Um, where's this? And it completely changes the dynamics in that relationship which is so powerful for birth. So if home birth is an option for you, maybe have a think about that. Um, uh, if it's not an option for you, perhaps you don't feel comfortable at home 
or there's um, a medical reason why you, it's wise to be in hospital, what can you do? So travelling into hospital um, and being in the hospital to make the environment um, as conducive and home-like as possible. So I would say um, do a dry run to the hospital. So however you're going to be going into hospital, ladies, this is for everybody watching, um, do a dry run. Maybe one of the last appointments, if you're having it at the same place, you're going to antenatal clinic, it's easy. You can just do it as if you're in labour. Um, if your appointments are somewhere else and they're not at the main hospital, maybe actually do it anyway. So go with your partner, if you have a partner, or your mum or your sister, whoever's going to be there, and take a cab in, you know, see where the cab drops you off so that you're confident and you don't get there in the middle of the night and you don't know where the entrance is because, you know, the main door is locked or, you know, that's quite stressful. If you're driving in, where are you going to park? Have it already figured out? Do you need change? Can you park? Can you pay with a um, credit card or a phone? You know, all that's sorted. Um, and then, obviously, if you're going in and you don't need to go in, treat yourself, you know, take yourself out for lunch or go and sit in the park for an hour or do something nice, you know, nearby wherever you are afterwards. So it's kind of, you know, you're, you're making it feel nice. So that's one thing I'd say. Um, things that can help when you're traveling in or when you're in the um, triage. So that means you're in the reception, maybe waiting to be seen by the midwife. Um, I work in an extremely busy hospital in London and I'm sure it's not the same across the country. I certainly hope it's not anyway, but certainly um, ladies can be s sat in the waiting area in strong labour for one hour, two hours sometimes if it's busy, God forbid three if it's mental. Um, and that is not relaxing. You're there in a shared room with mums, different mums and dads, all different things going on. Not, you know, it's not the most relaxed atmosphere. You're in labour. So what can you do in that situation? Um, so I think things that can be helpful are headphones with some music on or a relaxation um, MP3, uh, listening to that. Um, and actually, if you scroll down below, I've put a link to one of my free relaxations. So you're all welcome to listen to that in pregnancy, in labour, in the reception. Uh, it's very good for postnatal as well if you're, um, you know, a bit frazzled or tired and you're breastfeeding or, you know, you've just been up all night. So headphones is good. What about an eye mask? You know, a lovely, uh, you can get them that are filled with, um, what is it? Um, is it wheat germ? I think it's wheat germ with lavender eye mask that, you know, ties on. You can put that on in the car. You can put that on in the reception. Smell that lovely smell. Listening to something. It just takes you away from that, um, you know, less relaxing environment. So little things that can help. What about in the hospital? So if you're birthing in the hospital, wherever you're birthing, home, midwife-led unit, labour ward, whatever's happening with you, whether you've got the most complex medical history and you've got lots of things going on or you're doing it, you know, at home, it's the same principles apply. And I say this to all my hypnobirthing um, teachers and my hypnobirthing ladies, it's the same principles. You can apply these this to everything. So you want to make the environment as calm and lovely and relaxing as possible because essentially we're animals and our hormones respond to environment. So we're looking at smells. You want it to smell nice. Lighting, you want to be able to turn the lights down. So if you're in a hospital, you might not have whizzy dimmers, you know, if it's not particularly new unit, but you will have a couple of sources of light. There'll be the gorgeous strip lighting at the top. 
no good for anybody ever. Um, there will be uh, probably a, should be an ensuite bathroom which has a door and there's a light source in there and there's probably a lamp somewhere as well. So if you're with a birth partner, it's their job. Tell them when we get in, it's your job to set up the environment. I want nice smells. I want it to smell good. You know, some spray or some aromatherapy oils. I want... <laughs> I want... Um, I would like, maybe, um, the lights turned down. So maybe you're turning off the strip lighting, but you're leaving the ensuite on, opening up the door. Really nice. Um, I've, when I've been working as a midwife, I've supported, I think, two couples that brought in their own fairy lights that was pretty nice I felt like um Christmas basically which was magical you could take in something like that you you can take in those good um electric candles fantastic so light smells and um, what else is really important sounds get some nice music or background you know I love a bit of um tinkly spa water music really good you want to be doing some good breathing again there's a free video i've put the link below where you can learn how to do um, some good hypnobirthing breathing anyone can do it it doesn't matter what birth you're planning it will help you i promise you and um, to stay calm and relaxed and it's good if you do that with your birth partner so that they can support you with that as well and um, so loads of things i could go on i could talk about this probably for the rest of the hour but i should probably stop there so that's a good start i would say um so let me have a little cup of tea because i've been yabbering for about 20 minutes oh i'm just gonna have a sip Okay, I've got some more questions on my phone, but I'm going to do the ones that just pop up right now. So I've got, hi Laura, hey, it says, hi Nissa, I was to hold, I was told to hold my breath by several midwives when pushing, but I wanted to breathe my baby out. Is there ever a reason for holding the breath during pushing? Um, yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. I know that, um... There's lots of different approaches to the pushing part of labour. So, and actually, I'm not prescriptive. Because I'm both a midwife and a hypnobirthing teacher, I see that many different things work, if you see what I mean. So it's very much of, of what's happening with your body and your baby on the day, rather than being this, this and this, you know, it's, it has to be flexible, Laura, it has to be flexible. Um, so, um, people who have done some hypnobirthing, read a book or done a course will know about breathing the baby down. So, when you're getting to that stage where your, your body is involuntarily pushing, it just wants to push baby down with a lot of force, you can absolutely follow your body and go with your body, you know, and let it push down beautifully. Um, and for a first baby, that will take probably one to two hours of pushing, and that's completely normal for, for a first baby. It takes a while. Um, and for a second baby, it's generally a bit quicker. Third and fourth baby, they're out like a whippet, guys, um, normally. Not always, actually. Sometimes third babies are a bit, a bit mischievous. Um, anyway, so I would generally say follow your body, absolutely. Um, however, when the baby comes right at the end, so we talked about the head coming, so you're starting to see the head still pushing strongly. When it gets to here, so the head's really nearly there, absolutely, you can follow your body, mums, 100%, go with what your body wants to do. But quite often your midwife will say, actually, it's time to stop pushing right at the end. So, yeah, you could hold your breath or pant or blow. 
And those three things will all slow the baby's head right at the end so that it doesn't, you know, fly out and cause more damage. And that is a sensible thing to do. So I think, Laura, your midwife was probably doing it the way that she she trained and she learnt. Um, and she was saying, let me just read again, breathe a bit. Hold my breath. Yeah, they were probably just trying to get your baby to come out nice and slowly at the end, it sounds like. And I think that's quite sensible. Sounds sensible to me. We all do it different ways because we've all trained in different places, but it's the same principle, I would say. So I'm going to go to my, the rest of my questions in my, that lovely baby Maury sent to me. Okay. Oh, we've got quite a few more to go. Um, so here is a question from at Barefoot Yogini. So this is one from, um, Instagram. Barefoot Yogini says, due to pop with number two any day, oh how exciting, with my first I felt a very strong connection with him all the way through my pregnancy and had that rush of love everyone talks about when he was born. This time around I don't feel so connected with my daughter and have heard that the rush doesn't come so easily with the second one. Have you experienced that before with other mums? Worried I won't love her as much as I love my boy. Oh, that makes me feel a bit tearful. Um, actually, that makes me feel like I might cry. That Oh, bless you. Um, so, I think it's different for everybody. I, I'm actually welling up, guys. I think that was a bit much. Um, it's different for everyone. What I hear... Well, what I've heard a lot from second-time mums when I've worked working as a midwife more is that um, quite often with a second baby, mums feel a little bit disloyal, like they almost feel a little bit guilty, like they've had this this whole bubble of love with their first child and all this time and energy. Um, you know, to really devote to their first baby. And actually when second baby comes along, I think it's a it's a kind of it's a funny feeling of like feeling guilty, right? Feeling a bit guilty that suddenly you're gonna have to you know, your firstborn, your first big love is gonna be put on the side a little bit because there's this new person that is going to need a lot of your time and energy and I think those feelings of ambivalence are very common and very normal and maybe it's something that people don't talk about so much um, but I think it is it's pretty normal so I just I really want to reassure you barefoot you're going to need that um, love is not finite so you don't just have this much love to go around for everybody in your life. Love is like, I'm going a bit deep here guys, I wasn't expecting to be saying this. Um, love, it, it expands, it's infinite really. And the more special people you have in your life, including your children, the more love that you, you can feel, that you have the capacity to feel. And I think the experience with a first baby and a second is very different because with the first you have all that time in the pregnancy to focus and connect and, you know, you're reading the weekly updates from Baby Centre and you know how big your baby is and, um, you know, you're doing all this nesting and preparation. I remember it and it's amazing. It's really magical if you have a partner it can feel like a really special time in your relationship because it's like, you know, you're heading towards something beautiful. <laughs> With a second baby, and if there's any second time mums on here, you can tell me whether I'm right or, or wrong. With a second baby, I've only got one, but this is what I see from my friends who have two or three or four babies. Um, there, There's no time. There's no time to you know, 
be reading and researching and like daydreaming about this rose tinted future that damn there's not even enough time to like have a shower and eat properly and um you know if you've got little people generally you're pretty knackered all the time so it's just a completely completely different situation i think and that is no re reflection on how you're going to feel about your baby when they arrive and not everybody actually does feel that big rush as soon as their baby is born um it, and there's nothing wrong with that you know it can be a big explosion it can be a slow f slow build you know like it's it's a little bit more each day and i'm sure that's how it was with my daughter like i'm she's eight i'm crazy crazy mad in love with her like she's my whole universe i don't think i felt like that in the first day or the first week or the first month maybe not even the first year to be honest for me it was a total slow build um and i think that's okay too you know i think it's a lot of pressure on mums to feel you know feel that big you know what's expected of us being like the earth mother and we don't all get that um, so you're going to be fine, totally, totally fine. Um, Helen, I totally felt like that, felt guilty as heck. Yeah, there you go, Helen, but you do have enough love, don't worry. It's different, but you will love the second baby just as much. See, that's brilliant to hear. It's just the unknown, isn't it, Helen? You don't, you've had one, you don't know how it would be with two, and um, it's going to be fine, basically, I promise. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. I've only got about 15-20 fif minutes left. So I hope you're having fun, guys. I don't you know I don't know how you're doing out there because it's just me. But um, do if you have comments, do talk to me because I can see what you're saying. And it's nice to hear from you. So um, next question. This is from at Smadeva. I think that's how we say it from Instagram. What's the earliest you can start exercising postpartum and what would you recommend to get in the swing of things? So I think we have to be a little bit mindful about um, postnatal exercise and also um, postnatal pressure actually. Um, so I think there's so much pressure on women to to be as if they've never had a baby. So you've had a baby, but actually, um, can you just bounce back and be exactly like you were before? Um, that's what it's, is expected, and um, that's like bullshit, total rubbish. It doesn't work like that. Um, your body's going to be different. It's taken nine months to grow a baby. It's going to take nine months before you feel really, really strong and powerful again. You know, you may feel f okay, you may feel fine, but mums expect that you're going to need time to rest, especially if you're breastfeeding. It burns 500 calories a day. It takes it out of you. Time to rest, time for all your organs to go back to where they were before because they've all been pushed up time for the muscles to regain their tone um, it, it takes time so postnatal exercise I I think it's great to be active definitely so um, I would say you can start going for a nice gentle walk as soon as you feel ready so for some mums that will be four weeks for some mums that will be one week and for some mums they'll feel ready to go the next you know couple of days it's really individual you listen to your body and see how your body feels i think if you can get up and and start mobilizing just walking um relatively soon that will help your hormones to kind of level out and it's it, it reduces the risk of having a dvt deep vein thrombosis on a bit medical so that's good as well so being active in terms of exercise so the standard thing is to wait six weeks see your doctor 
and just be cleared off before you start anything more strenuous. Um, and if it depends on who you are. So if you're a very active, energetic, athletic person, then probably six weeks is going to feel too long for you and you're going to want to start a bit sooner. But you'll be doing maybe some gentle yoga stretches at home, you know, something very um, nourishing. Whereas if you're someone who's, you know, not so athletic and energetic, six weeks might not be long enough. It might be three months. So I think, yeah, listen to your body, um, but don't put un unnecessary pressure on yourself because um, I think, yeah, that's it's not helpful, especially when we're sleep deprived. Um, it's I think it's quite an achievement just when you have a two week old baby to like have a shower and um, eat. A healthy meal that's that's pretty good going I reckon um oh I've got more questions so Tegan I really do not want to be induced how can I avoid it so Tegan if you go back and watch from the beginning I talked about that earlier on so things you can do to reduce the risk of having an induction so pop back and you'll see that um, Tracy West I feel my partner is feeling that feeling he has a daughter from a previous relationship and we are expecting a boy oh absolutely and it's tricky you know so many people now um, have uh, different um, family units you know we're not all living in the 2.4 uh, you know mum and a dad two kids that's it lots so many and people now will have, um, you know, stepchildren or um, so many kids will have a stepbrother or a sister. And that adds, you know, different things into the mix, doesn't it, I think. Um, so maybe just talking openly, um, Tracy, about that would be uh, a healthy thing. And, and to say, like, that's OK, you know, that's all right. Um, we have these feelings, you know, we don't always choose to have them. They're just there, and if we're allowed to actually acknowledge them, especially for men, I think that's a good thing, isn't it? It's very helpful. Um, Rachel. Hi, Nissa. I ideally want a birth without medical invention, i.e. epidural. Firstly, firstly, are there any other alternative pain relief, alternative pain reliefs apart from epidurals that you would suggest? Apart from gas and air, I've been doing hypnobirthing sessions, which I love and really believe it can work, which I think is half the battle, it's remaining positive. This is my first birth and obviously I don't know my threshold for pain and I just want to get some advice to ensure more that I can have a drug-free birth. Great question, Rachel. Brilliant. So you're doing the hypnobirthing, brilliant. So I'd say, um, so mindset is so important. So it sounds like you're working on the mindset. You've probably got your breathing techniques, massage done with the hypnobirthing and some deep relaxation so that's brilliant um other strategies that are going to help you so i would rachel i'd write or everyone watching i'd like you to write a list of things that you're going to do in early labor when you're still at home um so that's when your contractions or surges are irregular um and they might be coming every 10 minutes every half hour and um, that kind of thing so I want you to write a list of like 10 things that you're going to do in early labour. So that's like going for a walk. Yes, you can go for a walk in early labour. Having a bath. Um, going out for a meal. Yes, you can go out for a meal in early labour. Absolutely fine. Go out for dinner, go out for lunch. Enjoy it. Um, it's a distraction. It's good fuel. Um, you might... Um, do some yoga stretching you might watch something hilarious on a box set it's all those kind of things so you want a strategy for early labor something that's going to keep you occupied relaxed and home for as long as you can stay home in terms of um, strong labor so you might be in the hospital or at home I definitely get a TENS machine, T-E-N-S machine. You can hire them for about 20 quid. You can buy them for about 60. They're brilliant. The mums I support rave about them. You use them from early labour through to strong labour. Some people will, will use that right up until the baby's born. Um, it sends, basically it's a little box that you have on a lanyard. You wear it connected to a couple of wires and some sticky 
pads at the back um, and you press the button when you get your contraction it sends an electrical signal through to your back and what that does is it interferes with the pain signals from your body to your brain which is one, very useful, and two, it increases your own natural endorphins so that your own natural pain relief is boosted. So that, they're brilliant. I recommend them. Please do not get in the bath with your TENS machine on or the shower because it will electrocute you, <laughs> just to put that in there. Um, I think the birth pool is brilliant, Rachel. I think every mum should give a birth pool a go, even if they don't fancy it. Just get in and see how you feel. And then um, if you don't like it, you can get out again. Nothing lost. So that's a really good one as well. And think of it as you've got multiple options. So you've got breathing, you've got massage, you've got gas and air, you've got TENS machine, you've got birth pool. Um, all of those things probably the support of whoever's with you is a massive thing as well so there's lots of strategies I would say to help you um oh I'm getting more questions ladies I'm gonna have to go in 15 and um, because I'm I've got something I have to do so I'm gonna whiz through as many as I can quickly Kirsty, hi Nissa if you're induced using a pestering or gel are you still able to have a water birth Kirsty, yes you are Kirsty. Um, if you go into labour after having the pessary or the gel, you can still have a water birth. If you go into labour after having your water broken, you can. If you need the drip, the oxytocin drip, um, then you can't um, because you're attached to a drip with a monitor on. So unfortunately, no. Uh, da -da -da -da. Laura Asby, what can you do in labour if contractions slow down? Um, so you can, these are the things you need to do if your contractions slow down. Go for a long walk, be in upright positions. Um, you need to think about if your baby is back to back. So one of the major causes of a long, slow labour is a back to back baby. Um, we see that all the time as midwives. It's a big deal. It's a big problem. It's like an epidemic, basically. Um, I've created a course to teach you online about that with two free videos, Laura. So if you go to the blurb down there um, later on, if you go to alignmybaby.com, you can sign up for two free videos that will teach you all about getting your baby into a better position. And you need to do that in pregnancy, ladies. So you need to get baby round to the front in pregnancy, so that they're not at the back during labour trying desperately to turn. And that can be, that can be really exhausting. Um, you need to eat and drink and labour regularly. Um, what else can you do? You need to relax, not always easy in labour. Get your oxytocin flowing. So you want to basically feel like you're in a spa. So the smells, the lights, the music, um, those things will definitely help you. Clary sage oil, massage or bath, which I spoke about earlier in the video, so you can click back and find out how to use that. Um, yeah, there's loads of things you can do, definitely, all of those. Oh, I'm getting a bit dry, guys, I'm going to have to have a little drink. Claudia. Sorry, this is my first baby and I don't really know much about this or haven't even thought about labour or having a birth plan. What is hypnobirthing? That is okay, Claudia. It's your first baby. You're at the beginning of a journey. We all have to start somewhere. So um, hypnobirthing is a practical method which gives you lots of tools and techniques to cope with labour on the day. It provides your partner, if you have a partner, um, with lots of tools so they're really confident and they're not stressed. And it makes, it completely changes your mindset. So if you're fearful or anxious, it means you let go of that anxiety so you can work with your birth hormones. Or if you're just feeling okay, then it can really make you feel excited, ecstatic, 
and really looking forward to, to that day when you meet your baby. So it's it's a big it's a big package of things. Um, you there's I'll teach you some free hypnobirthing breathing, Claudia. Just click through. There's a link down there, completely free. Um, to give you a bit of a taste, a bit more of what it's about. And I definitely recommend to all the ladies here, um, at the very minimum, buy a hypnobirthing book and read the book. And for some people, that's enough. The book and some nice MP3s can really help you. And the book that I give my clients and the one that I recommend most highly is the Calm Birth Method by Susie Ashworth. Um, she's a brilliant writer. It's the second edition came out this month. It's very modern. There's no hippie rubbish in there. It's very practical. Get your partner to read it as well, and I promise you it will help you. Brilliant. Um, next one from Jade. Hi Nissa, do you have any tips for birthing partners? My partner is a bit worried about what to expect and what's going to happen. It's our first baby and we're hoping to have a home birth. Are there any videos you recommend or things to read? Thanks Jade, that's a really good question actually and you've given me a brilliant idea for a video to make. So I think that's probably a vlog that I should make for birth partners. Brilliant one. Um, that video probably won't be ready for you. So what can we do in the meantime? So I would say if you have the funding, do a hypnobirthing course with your partner because that's it's completely designed for partners. Now that can be a couple of hundred pounds, so that might of course not be in your budget, it's not for everybody. So if that's not in your budget, what to do, ladies, for birth partners? Um, I, there's a brilliant book by Mark Harris, he's a male midwife, and he has written a book just for dads, um, and I can't quite remember the name, it's something like Love sex and birth I think um, it's really funny actually and probably it's the funniest birth book that I've read because they tend to be a little dry um, and it's a great place for partners to start to understand what they can do what's their role um, really the role of the birth partner is the protector of that bubble of um, calm relaxation and there, there's a lot that they can do and um, you want them to feel confident because if your partner is nervous, anxious, stressed, we're animals, you know, so that feeling goes through the room and you'll pick up on it and it can affect your birth hormones as well. So there's loads that they can do. Um, I'd start with that book, do the course if you can, um, and what else? Start to do a bit of reading around it and maybe sit down together and write um, down what you're expecting of each other. What do you expect of him to do on the day? So. Is he going to be setting up the room, the lights, the music, the atmosphere, giving you a massage, helping you to do your breathing, you know, reminding you to go to the toilet every two hours so your bladder is not full um, and that can, cause that can slow baby down, making sure that you're drinking enough fluids, reminding you to be upright and active and mobile, you know, those are the kind of things just in a quick summary that partners can do and that's really valuable I would say. Oh guys I'm gonna have to whisper I'm gonna have to go in a minute. Mm. I don't want to go though because I'm loving it. Um, Charlotte, hi with my firstborn I had a brilliant pregnancy and a water birth. Lovely Charlotte. Water birth, brilliant. I'm 30 weeks pregnant today and excited to be having a little girl. However, this time around I feel like she is very low and I can sometimes feel her kicking. So low, it feels like it's my vagina. Is it okay for her to be that low already? Also, I'm suffering with groin pain, which I didn't have the first time around. So number one, yes, it's completely normal. Uh, second baby feels completely different to the first. And lots of second time mums are walking around feeling like baby's head is in their vagina. 
again, glamorous, terribly glamorous. Um, it's normal, everything's stretched already once and so it's got a lot more capacity. Baby can sit a lot lower in a second pregnancy um, and that is normal. If you're having pain, I would say, um, Charlotte, do go to see a really good osteopath. So in pregnancy, lots of mums will have back pain, hip pain, groin pain. And quite often you might go and see your midwife and doctor or doctor and they'll say, no, it's normal, you're pregnant, it's normal. Um, actually, that pain is your body trying to tell you that something is misaligned in your pelvis, your ligaments, your fascia or your muscle and you don't have to put up with that pain through the rest of your pregnancy, it might be 10 weeks. Um, so go and find a really good osteopath, someone who works with pregnant women, someone that's recommended to you by a friend um, and they will do a, like an MOT on your pelvis so feel everything they'll be able to tell what's happening inside and they'll be able to correct any misalignment and actually to be honest ladies I'd recommend that every pregnant mum goes to see an osteopath if you can afford it it's normally about 40 or 40 to 60 pounds um, going to see an osteopath in pregnancy can correct misalignment which potentially can lead to a very long labour and a birth by a forceps or caesarean, emergency caesarean. So although it's a bit of money, it's such a good investment because you know that you've done everything in terms of alignment to, to, um, to give you the best opportunity of having a straightforward, quick birth. So it's something I'm very passionate about as well. Um, something that's in my Align Your Baby online course. There's four osteopathy postures that you can do at home to align your pelvis as well. So it's all in that course as well. It's very, very, very important. Um, next, okay, I can only do, guys, I'm going to do one more question on here and then the other questions in the email. So I'm so sorry, Laura, you're going to be my last Um because I'm, I have to whiz off. So Laura, I had a lovely first birth doing hypnobirthing. I want to let people know a first birth can be an incredible experience, even though obviously it is scary, but I honestly enjoyed my birth. Awesome! Did a lot of breathing, used the TENS machine, and my husband got good at the massage for contractions. Yeah! Had no pain relief. It's all about the breathing and the water birth for me. That was great. Love listening to you, Nissa. You are so reassuring and we need more people. Oh, well, that is so nice, darling. That's, that's awesome. I, I love reading that. So I'm going to finish off the last questions. What have we got? We've got a couple of quick ones. Would you recommend placenta encapsulation? Um, so, placenta encapsulation, it means when your placenta is birthed, someone comes and picks it up, they take it off, they dry it out for you and they return pills to you. Um, so, there's no very big clinical trial that, um, will, that supports placenta encapsulation, so there's been no big trial done. There never will be a big trial done because it's not in the, you know, the big pharma pharma corporations interest to do that so you know that's by the by um every mum i've ever spoken to that has had their placenta encapsulated has raved about it i've not done it personally myself and um, i i think actually it's a very interesting thing and it does seem like it definitely does benefit mums is that placebo or not we'll never know we'll never know but it's you know, it seems to be really popular. Um, and actually, I had a message, I think, yesterday from one of my clients saying, um, I've been loving my placenta pills. Um, so, yeah, awesome. So I think it's up to you. It's up to you. If you, if you feel that that's something that you can afford, um, it's probably worth a go. Last two questions. I would like to know what you recommend about stimulating the start of birth. Ah, we've talked about this. I'm currently 41 weeks pregnant and want a natural birth. So 
preferable no medical invent intervention or other interventions like intentionally rupturing the membrane but I feel I have no choice if I'm near the 42 week mark okay so we talked about this earlier and I gave you a list but just to add on so that was at Maxime Aline from Instagram and um, so it is your choice Maxime so I if you don't want to be induced you don't have to be no one can force you to be induced um, it's always your choice so I would weigh up the options um, as in what's the risk so the risk of stillbirth increases a little bit after 42 weeks how do you feel about that I think it goes it's something like 1 in 900 at 40 weeks to about 1 in 700 and something at 42 weeks for some mums, that is a big increase, and that means they'll definitely opt for the induction. And for some mums, that increase doesn't feel like a big, a big risk. And so maybe you would negotiate an extra one, two or three days um, before you go for that induction of labour. If you aren't going to be induced, you'd go in for daily monitoring on the machine for a half hour. Probably have your placenta scanned as well to see if it's working well we don't want to you know take any unnecessary risks um, and do all the things that I spoke about before yeah a lot of things you can do I um, acupuncture for me is my favorite 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 and the last question what are medical interventions that are seen to be less necessary in your opinion and that was at Bali Bolly um, from Instagram. Ah, oh, that's a really difficult question, my darling. I've ended with a really difficult one. Um, it's not re it doesn't really work like that. So it's a case by case basis, as in um, what's going on for mum, what's going on for baby on the day, what's the safest thing, you know, for mum and baby, and obviously considering as well what does mum and baby what does mum and mum and dad or mum and mum want as well so you, I think I can't I can't answer that one oh no <laughs> oh well ladies that was fun um what else to say that's it I'm I'm all tuckered out I'm gonna have to go and have a little lie down now I think um I really enjoyed this thank you so much for having me Maury this it was really fun I will be back, ladies, next week. I'll be talking about how to get the most out of your postnatal experience, so the first few days and, and week or two um, after baby's born. Um, so I hope that you will join me for that next week and um, they'll be letting you know where, when it is and you can write your questions for that one then. And have an awesome day. And that's me. And I'm going to go. Bye. Bye, guys.